Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. If I were alone and I was studying my Bible and I found something exciting in the Bible, I were at my house. I would run and get my wife, like a little boy, who found something special. Like a little boy who was out in the garden and maybe he found himself an Indian head. An arrowhead. And he picked that thing up and he looked at it and the first thing he thought about was, I'm going to go show my daddy what I have. He had to make a study. Christian appearance. No idea what I would find. I feel like I've been panning for gold. And in the panning of the gold, I discovered many just precious gold nuggets in the sand that I was swishing back and forth with the water. I would just like to share it with you. I have nobody in mind. Nobody. picture is worth a thousand words, what kind of a picture does our Christian appearance portray? If a picture is really worth a thousand words, and I'm sure they are and probably many more than a thousand words, what kind of a picture do we have? You know, there are times in a Christian life when God puts an impression on somebody's heart and He does it through another individual or maybe through a family or maybe just an act that someone did. But it, it seems to be anointed by the Spirit of God and it seems like God takes His pen and draws a border around that picture and it stamps it upon the heart of the believer and you never forget it. What is spiritual you just don't lose it. And I desire, I desire to teach this lesson. But I desire for you to hear it more than I desire to teach it. Which means I'll do what I have to to keep you to hear it. As I look back in my life and the experiences that God has led me through and the, the, the several different things that have happened to me, I can remember several pictures that God made in my heart. Several times where the Holy Spirit of God just went like this. And put a border around a picture of an individual or a picture of a family or maybe a service that I went to. And He said, that's holy. Remember it. That's of me. Write it on the table of your heart. And it's been implanted there. May I tell you one of those? Two weeks ago, I set out to do a study. Uh, well, when I started out, I, I called it modesty. I thought I knew what the word modesty meant, and I set out to do a study on modesty in the Bible. And 
And I've learned this, that when the Lord from heaven begins to inspire a message and lead through His Word, He many times also inspires a happening, an illustration, an easy way to take His Holy Word and make it clear for everybody to see. God uses illustrations to do that. A week ago, on a Saturday evening, I went to a, a Brethren camp meeting. I was there at the Brethren camp meeting. There were about 300 people there. I was asked several weeks ago to bring a message to the youth. Brother Denny, would you come and bring a message to the youth at our camp meeting? I said, I'd be glad to. I showed up there, ready to go, sermon in my Bible, all prepared, and I sat there in the front of that auditorium, and then all the people started to come in. And they had the auditorium set up in such a way that they had the first three rows here and the first three rows here set aside for the ladies, the young ladies, and the young men. So if you can just picture this with me. Here I sit, serving in my Bible, ready to go, know what I'm going to say, burden on my heart, the direction that I think God wants me to go is all planned out, and I'm sitting there very quietly in a seat, and everyone starts to gather together for the meeting. And the young ladies and the young men started gathering in. And as the young ladies started to come in, they all seemed to come in this door over here. I don't know why. And all the young men came in this door over here. And I was sitting in a chair right over here. And they started to file in. And there was probably 30, 35, maybe 40 young ladies that came walking through the door there. And as they walked through the door, my spirit began to grieve within me. Uh, as the things that I saw and the spirits that were manifest in the young ladies that walked through the door. The clothes that they wore, they just, they just didn't seem right. The spirit that they had, it wasn't right. There were uh, many, many small coverings. There was much puffing of the hair. There was uh, thin materials and, uh, and uh, clingy materials, dresses, and, and the dresses were too short. And, and many times uh, the legs were uncovered and uh, uh, see-through nylons were worn. And, and all these young ladies came through here and of course, this is what I'm here for. All these people are coming in here and I'm to have a message and to uh, challenge these young people to live for God and they begin to file in here. And I begin, as I look upon that, I begin to uh, take the temperature, so to speak, and, re and I begin to realize just where these young people are as they begin to file in here. And my, sp my spirit began to grieve and my heart began to ache. And there, was, there began a turning inside my heart, and I didn't know what to do. It's a very uncomfortable situation when you, you think you know where you're going, and you got the sermon all written out, and everything's planned, and then you sit there in a service, and all of a sudden, something begins to turn inside your heart, and you don't know which way to go. Should I go ahead and do what I was supposed to do? Or, Lord, are you trying to tell me something else? And I just didn't know what to do. This five minutes before the service starts. After all these young ladies filed in there, with all their bouffant hairdos, with a little covering on the top, and all this kind of attire, a young lady walked through the door. She stepped up in the door there, and she just stood in the doorway, as if looking over the area to see where she was supposed to sit. She was different. She was different from all the other young ladies that had marched through that door before her. I like to call her a daughter of Zion. That's what she was. May I say this in the right spirit and you'll understand what I mean as the message goes on. She was beautiful. She was just beautiful. She stood there in that door. She had her head well covered. She had on a dress that was long enough. She had on a dress that was loose enough. It covered her body. And there was grace and power upon her head. 
And I'm telling you, just as surely as if as if God Almighty moved in and drew the picture around it. God just, with His Holy Spirit, He just drew a picture frame around that young lady and took a stabbing with me inside my heart. And He said, that is Christian modesty. I still called it modesty at that point. I hadn't studied far enough yet. That is Christian modesty. She had a spirit, she had a meek and quiet spirit that you could sense. She had a meek and quiet spirit that you could see. She had a spirit of inner self-discipline. You could tell that young lady had control of herself. You could tell that young lady was disciplined in her inner life. You could tell she knew what she was supposed to do. She, you could tell she knew how to act. You could tell she did what she was doing on purpose. On purpose. What a contrast. What a contrast. For all these young ladies to walk through the door, and then for this young lady to step in the door, and then slowly with grace all over, and by that I mean the power of God, she walked across the room and she sat down with the other young lady. And then the servant just went, shoo, turned completely around. And I thought, all right, here I am. I'm supposed to have the message. Here it is. Lord, Go ahead. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. Then I really let one rip there. And I had to think later. Now, what? What was so beautiful about that young lady? I had to think it through in my mind. Well, now, it wasn't her hair. She was well covered. Her head was well covered. It wasn't her hair. Now, I think, it wasn't her dress. Her dress wasn't exceptionally beautiful. The material wasn't appealing. What was beautiful about this young lady? And she had on a pair of glasses, and I think she had somewhat of a sight problem because the lenses in her glasses were a little thicker than normal. And that didn't add to the beauty of the young lady. And I had to think, what was so beautiful about that young lady? And the Lord brought this to mind. She had the beauty of holiness. That's what was beautiful. She had the beauty of holiness. And that's what made her beautiful. Later on, I found out and heard the testimony of this young lady. And in her home, she lives continually under the pressure of her mother to shorten it up and tighten it up and brighten it up. Why don't you shorten your dress? Why don't you look like the other girls? Why don't you tighten it up? Why don't you get a brighter color? And on and on it goes every time it's time to make a new dress in her house. The battle is on. The pressure is on. Why don't you shorten the dress? Why don't you tighten it up? Why don't you get a different kind of material? Why don't you get a brighter color? That young lady, with real Bible conviction in her heart, she bows her head to her mother and she says, Oh, mother, I just cannot do it. A title to a chapter in a book. God wants you beautiful. That's the title to a chapter in a book. <clears throat> well, I would like to say amen to the statement, but not to the chapter in the book. This particular chapter in the book is promoting makeup, hairdos, and stylish clothes. And by twisting all kinds of scriptures... This lady proves that God wants every woman to be beautiful. It's not wrong for you to desire that, that attractiveness. And it's okay to go ahead if the bar needs painted to paint it. And if you need a little decoration, go ahead and hang an ornament here and a little gold here and put a little red here and a little blue here and, and a little bit of black up here. And it, it doesn't matter because God wants you to be beautiful. 
God sees the flowers beautiful and God wants you to be beautiful. Well, might I say that nobody goes out and paints the flowers a different color or makes them a different way than God made them. We leave the flowers just exactly the way God made them and I think we need to leave ourselves just exactly the way that God made them. We don't have to add to nor take off anything. But I do want to say amen to the statement. God wants you beautiful. But He wants you to be clothed in His beauty and not the beauty of the world. There is a big difference. Let me share a testimony I shared before. When I went this part of Tennessee, I had no idea. I had no idea what modesty was. I had no idea how a young lady, how a Christian woman should look. I walked into that church house. I walked into the back. Everyone was seated already. The sisters on one side, the brothers on the other side. And I stepped into that room and the Spirit of God just leaped inside my heart and said, Amen to what I saw. My heart cried out, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Is God concerned with how we look? Yes, He is. Does God put the grace of His presence on a Christian young lady, a Christian woman, who lives by the principles of the Word of God? Yes, He does. Yes, He does. 1,400 times in the Bible, dress and how we dress is mentioned. I think God is concerned about how we look. Very concerned. The world uses clothes to advertise the body by exposure, by color, and by form fit. How will God's people respond? Will we respond like the world does? Will we use the tactics that the world uses? Will we try on their methods? I hope not. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Very familiar verse. In like manner also, I will wait for you to find In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but with becoming women professing godliness with good works. Now these two verses right here, they are the eternal word of God. They were written out, they were breathed out before the foundation of the world. It's as much God's Word as John 3.16. It's got just as much depth in it as John 3.16. And I would challenge any one of you ladies and any one of you men to see how far you can dig out of these two verses right here. There is a depth of riches in these two verses. Sometimes I think we pass over verses like this and we'll take the verses like um, we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and we'll meditate on those and think about them and think about them and oh how thrilled we are and how thrilled we ought to be that we have a heavenly position in Christ Jesus and that we are lifted up far above principalities and powers and all these things and that ought to thrill our hearts and it ought to be a blessing to meditate on that and there's depth in that and there's, uh, there's understanding in that in the knowledge of God but there's just as much depth in these two verses as there is in the verses that we just spoke about Christ Jesus. There's depth in these verses. There's, uh, there's gold nuggets in there. There's precious pearls in there. But I'm afraid that most people read over these verses very quickly and just say, yeah, I think I know what they mean and keep right on going. I think we need to park on these verses for a while. I think we need to meditate on them for a while. I think we need to open our heart before the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit of God, will you not give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation on this subject also? Because there's depth here. 
It's the Word of God. It's just as eternal as any other word in the Bible. Maybe look at some of the words here. Just think about them some. Much to my surprise, modest did not mean law. Modest did not mean covered. Modest didn't mean loose. Modest didn't mean the opposite of fancy, and modest didn't mean the opposite of pretty, nor the opposite of sexy. It didn't mean any of those things. I was very surprised. Let me tell you what modest means. Modest means orderly. Modest means decent. Modest means harmonious. Modest means moderate. Moderation. Modest means neat. Modest means clean. That's what modest means. As I studied in the Bible. Well, I must admit I was very shocked when I first saw that. I really... I thought when I got in that first modest, boy, oh, I'll tell you what, I'd find some things down in there that I've been wanting to know for a long time, and it wasn't none of it in there. Hold on. I didn't find it, but I didn't find it in that verse. I didn't find it in that word. It wasn't there. Surprise what I found. Orderly. Decent. Harmonious. Moderation, neat, clean, modest. Modest means take a bath. Modest means wash your hair. Modest means iron your dress. Next word I'd like to look at is apparel. Let me give you the Greek word. Apparel. Here's the Greek word. I won't mean anything to you. Katastola. That word apparel means katastola. Find expository dictionary. New Testament Greek words. Find says katastola or apparel means a loose outer garment. Clark. What's his first name? Adam Clark is this great commentator. Listen to what he says about the catastola. That's a specific name that's entitled to a specific type of dress that the Grecians wore. And it's called a catastola. Stola. We get our word stole from that. Listen to what Clark says. The catastola is a Greek dress. It's a long piece of material which hung down to the feet in front and behind, girded with a belt. It had another piece of material which hung down to the waist, loosely over the front and over the back. And it's called a kata stola. Clark also said this. What year did he write that commentary? Does anybody know? 1700? 1700s? He said this. A more modest and becoming dress than the Grecian dress has never been invented. This was his estimation of the kata stola. The kata stola is a Greek dress. It's a long piece of material which hung down to the feet in the front and behind. It was girded with a belt, a belt that tied. And it had another piece of material which hung down to the waist over the front and over the back. And it was loose. And they called it a catastola or they called it apparel. Well, let me give you a little interpretation then. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in orderly, decent, harmonious, 
moderate, neat, clean dresses that hang down to the front and hang down to the back and tie in the middle and have a piece of material that comes down over the front, down to the waist and over the back, down to the waist. Let the women adorn themselves in this neat and clean and orderly and presentable kata stola. That's what it says. Let's go a little further. In 1 Peter 3.3, 3, the word apparel is also used. But it's a different word. The word in 1 Peter 3.3 3 is a Greek word that says himation. H-I-M-A-T-I-O-N. Himation. And it means also a loose-fitting outer garment. But there's something very interesting about this apparel. Let me read it to you. There's two words that go together. There's two words. One of them is himation. That's the one I just read you. The other is not hope I'm saying he's right. Brother Eric. And the other one is shiton. Himation and shiton. Those are opposite words. Himation is a loose fitting outer garment. Shiton is a very close fit, tight knitted under garment. And the two went together. In Bible days they wore a shiton, a, 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 a very tight fitting under garment, and they wore a himation, a very loose fitting outer garment. They wore them together. Let me read you some of it. Himation, an outer garment, a mantle thrown over the shiton. Here's the definition of shiton. Shiton denotes, denotes, denotes the inner vest or undergarment and is to be distinguished as such from the himation, the outer garment. The, the, the distinction is made, for instance, in the Lord's command in Matthew 5.40. If any man go to law with thee and take away thy coat, sheeton, undergarment, let him have thy cloak, himation, outer garment, also. That's what Jesus was saying. If any man go to law and take your undergarment, you turn right around and give him your outer garment also. Another one. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garment, himation, in the plural, his outer garment, and the coat, the shitan, the inner garment, which was without seam, woven from the top throughout. The outer garments were easily divisible among the four soldiers, but they could not divide the shitan without splitting it, so they cast lots for it. It was, uh, Oh, it's sort of like a t-shirt that you'd wear, only, only heavier than that. And it was made by knitting. It was made by knitting with one big long piece of string. It was knit together and it had, it had no seam in it. You just pull it down over your body. It was the sheeton. It was the undergarment. Here's another example. Dorcas was accustomed to make coats, sheeton, and garments to nation. That is, the close-fitting undergarments and the long-flowing outer robes. Dorcas made both, Mr. Rhoda. Listen to this. A person was said to be naked, whether he was without clothing or had thrown off his outer garment. And then it gives the example of Peter. You know, where the disciples uh, they were wondering what happened to the Lord and what was going to happen and what about this kingdom and all these things. And they decided, well, let's just go back and go fishing. And they were out there in the fishing boat and they fished all night long and caught nothing. And then the Lord stood by the bank. And as he stood by the bank, he told them to, to uh, cast the net on the other side. And oh, it filled up with fish. And right away, John said to them, it, it's the Lord. And as soon as Peter heard that it was the Lord, 
he was naked. Now, he wasn't naked. He wasn't out there without any clothes on. He was out there with only his sheet on, on and he quickly put his hemat. All of us can learn from this. It seems very clear to me that God never planned for our outer garments to look like our undergarments. God never planned for the outer garments to fit like the undergarments. May I just pay my respect to t-shirts out in public. That's an undergarment. If you were to stand in the presence of Jesus Christ and you are out in the public with a t-shirt on, then God would consider that you're naked. That you had your undergarment on and you need to put your outer garment over it and cover up your body. By the way, in the last example that we read there, it wasn't talking about ladies, it was talking about men. The men wore an undergarment and an outer garment. The men covered their bodies also. The men were careful that their bodies did not show. They did not run around in their undergarments so that everybody could see their tight, the, the, the undergarments spinning tightly over their body so that everyone could see what their body looked like. They did not do that. They covered their bodies. We need to do the same thing. I'm not, I'm not standing up here promoting that the men start wearing a robe. But I am saying that the men need to make sure also that their clothes fit the way they ought to fit. And they fit in a way that doesn't reveal the body. I think it's good for us also to dress on purpose. And when we go to get a pair of pants, we get the pair of pants so that it fits loosely. Loose-fitting garments, says the Bible. I don't think we need to buy a pair of pants that fit so tight without a belt or a pair of suspenders that we can just wear it without a belt or a pair of suspenders. We're supposed to have loose-fitting garments on. I don't think we need to go and buy a shirt that's custom fit, that fits tight up here and tighter down here at the waistline. I think we need to buy shirts that fit loosely. I think when we wear a coat, we need to wear a coat that fits loosely. Not a form-fitted coat, not a special tailored coat that's going to show exactly the form of our body, but rather a coat that was made specifically to cover the body. I think that's in order. If it's in order for the ladies, it's also in order for the men. And I might say also, if it's in order for the men, it's in order for the little boys. It's in order for us to sit our little boys down and say, little boys, this is how men dress. We do this on purpose. We wear these kind of shirts on purpose. We wear them loose on purpose. You're going to wear this pair of pants this way on purpose. You're going to put this belt on or these suspenders on on purpose. Because, son, we wear pants to cover our body, not to expose our body. I think that would be in order if we did that. <laughs> but I remind you, that those Greek words were breathed out by a holy God. They were breathed out. Holy men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost. And those Greek words came out from the heart of God. In the Old Testament days, a heart wore basically the same thing. Now, they weren't like today. They weren't as bold as they are today. In Old Testament days, they wore, they wore an apparel. But their apparel was very uh, bright, and their apparel was very attractive, and their apparel was very rich-looking, and their apparel would, uh, they would go out of their way to make sure their apparel had an attraction to it, a draw to it. Not only that, in the Old Testament days, the harlots would keep their apparel, but they would put a slit from the bottom of the leg all the way up to the side so that the harlot could bare her leg and bare her thigh. In Old Testament days, you, there was such a thing as the attire of a harlot. When the, when the fathers used to sit their sons down and teach them out of the book of Proverbs and warn them about that harlot who's out there in the middle of the night standing there on the corner, he used to say to his boys, Boys, 
there is a, such a thing as the attire of a harlot. When you see the attire of a harlot, you stay away. When you see the attire of a harlot, you run the other direction. When you see the attire of a harlot, you make as quick passage as you can in the other direction from that. That's a bad thing. Men of God in the Old Testament would sit their boys down and teach them out of Proverbs to stay away from the harlots. Not only that, but the harlots were known by the way they wore their hair. But listen, in Old Testament days, they didn't cut their hair. Women didn't cut their hair in Old Testament days. It was a shame to cut your hair. Even the harlot, it was a shame to cut her hair. If she were to walk out with her hair cut off the way ladies cut their hair off now today, if she were to walk out in a public, she'd be shamed by everybody. So, they didn't do that. They let their hair grow long. Their hair was just as long as some of the ladies in this room. Long. Long hair. Maybe down to here in the back. But ah, the harlot, she let it down. She stood on the corner and she let it all down and stood on the corner. <laughs> it's pretty hard today to give instruction to a boy on the attire of a harlot. I mean, everywhere you look, you almost have to tell the boy that everywhere you look is a harlot. That's the attire of a harlot and that's the attire of a harlot. Stay away from that, stay away from there, stay away from this and this and this and this. Because everywhere you look, you see the attire of a harlot. Nevertheless, I think it's a holy and a wise thing for fathers to do with their boys. Turn to Isaiah 47. Now, there's a lot of verses on all this stuff, and I do not desire to go into a lot of it, but I would just like to look at this one. It lays a little ground for it. In Isaiah 47, verse 1 through 3, we're talking about Babylon. God is likening Babylon unto a beautiful, aspiring, elegant lady who has all the attention. Come down and sit in the dust O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground. There is no throne. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make fair the lake. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. Now just notice a few words here, and then we'll just go on. Let down thy hair, make bare thy leg, make bare thy thigh, and then the word nakedness and the word shame. It seems to me the context of these verses is saying, Oh! beautiful daughter of Babylon, oh, wonderful, graceful, delicate, and all these things, I'm going to shame you, and the way I'm going to shame you is I'm going to make you naked. And the way I'm going to make you naked is I'm going to bear your leg, and I'm going to bear your thigh, and on that your hair is going to be let down, and your nakedness and your shame shall come upon you. Strong words. May I ask you a question? Ask yourself and ask God, how much of my life do I want to display for public gaze? How much of my life do I want to display for all the public to look at? Ask yourself that question. Look at another word. Shamefacedness. Shamefacedness is a soft word as opposed to a hard word. It's a soft word. It it means it means shyness. It means the spirit of shyness or uh, 
faithful. It's the opposite of boldness. A woman who is shamefaced, and shamefaced, remember, is a spirit. It's a spirit of shyness. A woman who is adorned with the spirit of shyness will have a problem boldly facing, talking, challenging men. She'll have a problem with that. She won't be able to do it. She'll quickly look away when talking to men. That's what shamefacedness means. It's a soft word. It's a graceful, lovely word. Let's look at another word. Sobriety. Now, sobriety is not a soft word. Sobriety is a hard word. One soft one, one strong one. Sobriety, it comes from the same word as God says over there in, the, in 1 Peter 5. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's what it means. Sobriety means a habitual inner self-government. The inner spirit of self-control or inner strength. Sobriety means inner strength. It means a habitual self-government over the inner self. That's what it means. Would you please <clears throat> So, here we have a soft word, and here we have a strong word. And both words, they're an attitude. Uh, they're a spirit. They're, they're manifest. You can see them. You can sense them. Remember, it said adorned. And what is adorned is seen, and you can see shamefacedness. And you can see sobriety. It's an expression. It's a, it's an, you can see the expression of that inner self-control on the face of the lady who truly has the spirit of sobriety. And you can see the expression of shyness or shamefacedness on the face of the one who truly has the spirit of shyness or shamefacedness. You can see it. It's an ornament. One more word, a little further down, and that's the word good works. What shall I wear today? What shall I wear today? Let's see. Blue, uh, brown, uh, what shall I wear today? Put on good works. Put on good works. That's one of the ornaments. What shall I wear today? I think I'll help a sister today. What shall I wear today? I think I'll sew a dress for somebody who needs one. What shall I wear today? I think I'll nurse a child who's hungry. What shall I wear today? I think I'll keep a home for a husband. What shall I wear today? I think I'll be an encouragement to my husband. What shall I wear today? I think I'll lift up the heart of one who's needing. What shall I wear today? Put on good works. One more word. Now we'll go all the way back up to the first part of the verse and look at the word adorn. Because it's a key word. <clears throat> adorn means. You ready for this? It means cosmetic. Adorn means ornament. Adorn means decorate. Decorate a cake. Decorate a room. Decorate a special plaque to put on the wall. Adorn means to decorate. Adorn means to ornament. I think I'll put an ornament here, and I think I'll put an ornament here. Adorn means to cosmetic. I don't know what cosmetic means. What does it mean? Paint? Maybe? 
seems like it would. Seems like it would mean paint. Just cosmetic. That's what the word adored means. By the way, it's a good word. Adorn is something that's done on purpose. It's a word of beauty. It's a word of beauty. And God put it there. You know what I think? I think God put that word there special for you ladies because He knows what you ladies are made of. I think He put it there. I did a little looking through the Bible. You know how God talks to the men? God talks to the men and says, Get dressed. God talks to the men and says, Put your clothes on. God talks to the women and He says, Adorn yourselves. Cosmetic yourselves. Isn't that interesting that God would use such a word to the ladies? You suppose God knew the ladies' heart? You suppose God knew that ladies were different than men? And that ladies had a tendency toward that? I think so. I think so. Adorn is an elegant word. It carries the spirit of elegance in it. But, all the words that follow describe the beauty that God is wanting. You say, oh, what is beautiful? It's a natural feeling. I'm a woman, and women want to be beautiful. Amen. That's fine. But we must sanctify our hearts to know what God calls beautiful, and we need to see it as beautiful so that it's precious to us and we'll go pick it up like a beautiful ornament and hang it on our body. See? That doesn't mean that we're to go out and find the prettiest, fanciest dress and hang it on our body because God doesn't say that the prettiest, fanciest dress is beautiful. It says we're supposed to get that which God calls holy and we're to look at that thing as if it were holy because it is and holiness is beauty, is it not? And take that thing which is beauty and which is holiness and adorn ourselves with it just like the queen puts on her royal robe. Well, doesn't God want me beautiful? Yes, He does. But His beauty... Now, I had this thought. We don't need to be changing to make ourselves beautiful. Rather, we need to change how we feel about what is beautiful. We don't need to be in front of a mirror wondering how we can make ourselves more beautiful, but rather, we need to be in front of this mirror finding out what is more beautiful than God and changing our own heart about it. And therefore, we would rejoice and we'd fit right into the mold that God made us and in our heart would be drawn to adorn ourselves with the very things that God calls beautiful and we'd find the satisfaction that only women can find in adorning and decorating and cosmetic themselves. So if you can look at the verse now, if you can look at it now, in like manner also that women adorn themselves with modest, clean, orderly apparel, that dress which hangs down in the front and the back and ties in the middle and has something extra that hangs over the front and the back. Let the women grace their body with that moderated, beautiful dress. That's what God's saying. And not only that, but God wants you with just as much care, just like you decorated a cake. God wants you also to be that concerned that you grace yourself with shamefacedness and sobriety and good works. And oh, if I could just get the picture, and maybe you're getting the picture better than I am because I'm not a woman. And I don't know how quite how you feel, but I think I feel just a little bit how you feel. And how you're scurrying around and so careful that everything is just right and all that. And that's all right and good. But let's make sure that what we're making is just right and just right according to the Bible. And not according to our natural ideas of what's just right. 
And once we find out what's just right according to the Bible, let us with grace in our heart and let us move forward and adorn our bodies with those things and just be glad and know that we are dressed like the queen because we are in God's eyes. A few thoughts. What about dress for success? Aren't we supposed to dress for success? When I was in college, they made us read a book called Dress for Success. And in that book, they had the, the psychology of appearance. I mean, it's a whole psychology. In the book, they told you this. When it's time for you to go to the bank and borrow a bunch of money to build your church, you wear a green suit because the banker will see you coming in with a green suit on and you'll be able to more easily get money than if you had a black suit on. And believe it or not, those preachers go out of that school and when it's time to go to the bank and borrow money, they put on a green suit. And they do it confidently and they walk in there thinking that banker is going to look at that green suit and give them more money. Isn't that silly? In that book it says if you're a man of authority, you need to look like a man of authority. There's a difference in colors of authority and colors that not are of authority. If you want to be a man of authority, you should wear the darker colors. Wear yourself a white shirt, wear yourself black shoes, either a dark uh, brown or a black suit, or maybe one of these heavier plaid type suits. That's what you want to wear. Nothing else. If you're a businessman and you want to be successful and you want to have authority, then that's what you need to wear. Don't wear all those bright powder blue suits and, and don't wear all those uh, flashy plaids. Don't wear those. You know what it also says? And this chapter they tore it out of the book in the college, and I'm glad for that. But it tells the young men that if, you're, if you want to get you a young lady, you wear all those bright colors. You get you a powder blue suit and all the ladies will like you. You wear it to work and all the ladies at work will like you for it. But we had to tear that chapter out of the book. Isn't that interesting? It says in the book, if you're a secretary and you meet people, you need to dress being ready to meet people. You want to be soft and you want to be bright and cheerful. Wear yourself bright yellow and uh, make sure that your blouses are very thin with lots of frill and lots of, uh, of lace on them because you're meeting the people and, and you want to be a real hit when you meet the people. So make sure that you dress for success and put the frill on and make your colors brighter because your personality needs to be bright when you meet the people. If you want to be a successful secretary, that's the way you should dress. The psychology of dress. Well, what about dress for success? Do we need to follow any of that? Can we learn something from that or can we get rid of something from that? Well, I'm a bright, sunshiny person. So I, therefore, I want to wear how I feel. Well, let's see how that makes it up. Brother Andy? Brother Andy is a bright, sunshiny person. I mean, when Andy smiles, he's got a bright smile. And his bright blue eyes just gleam when he smiles. Shall we put a bright powder blue suit on him so that he can dress the way he feels? Does that make any sense at all? Well, why is it any different for the ladies? Wouldn't hold out for the men, would it? When I traveled with a revival team up in Canada, I showed up there for work the first time. They didn't know what they were getting. I showed up there with a with a black suit and a dark brown suit and a navy blue suit. And I had four white shirts and one pair of black shoes. And I showed up there to go to work in the revival team. And I mean, that place was enthusiastic and they were full of excitement and all this. And after about four or five days of me working there with my black suit on and my black shoes and my white shirt, they called me aside and said, Brother Denny, don't, don't you have any bright blues or a, or maybe a pastel green suit or don't you have anything that looks bright? Ooh, this is exciting work here. We want you to be enthusiastic. Couldn't you put on one of those? And I had to take that one to the Lord and I laid that before the Lord and I said, oh God, I don't see how I can put one of those crazy things on. The way they wear them, that's what they want me to wear. What am I going to do? And I finally went back to them and just told them, I don't think I can wear it. I don't think I can do it. And they backed off. But that, what kind of philosophy is that? What are we 
we give it into if we're thinking that way? in our children. I sit my children down and teach them non-resistance. I want them to have the conviction of non-resistance and I'm not about to wait until they get converted to teach them anything about non-resistance. In any other doctrine of the Bible, any other conviction of the Bible, why do we sit our children down the same way and say, dear boy, dear little girl, we dress on purpose around here. We do what we do on purpose. We do it because the Bible says so. This is how we're going to look and this is why we're going to look that way. Wouldn't that be in order? I think so. I'll tell you what you'll get if you start teaching those principles. You'll get a fanatic. You'll get a fanatic on your hands. They'll rise up above you. Make my dress longer. Make it stronger. I want to be longer. An argument that's given. God made the flowers beautiful and attractive and they draw attention. Why can't I? I've heard that one a lot of times. Night I have. We are flowers. We are not flowers. We are flesh. And the Bible says to make no provision for the flesh. And there is a difference between us and a flower. There is a difference. Maybe we could just shortly look at God's attitude about natural beauty in the book of Proverbs. Favor is deceitful. That word favor means charm and confidence. Favor, charm and confidence is deceitful. And beauty, natural beauty, is vain or empty or foolish. I went to a meeting recently. And as most meetings go, uh, after the meeting was over, uh, the people gathered together and do a little fellowshipping. And as I was walking out of the meeting house, I just took a quick glance across the ladies. They were all standing in one corner. And here were the mamas standing over there, the, the older ladies, <clears throat> well covered, long enough dresses. This is going to go for a while. I hope you bear with me. Well covered, long enough dresses, loose enough dresses, and here stood their daughters right next to them. Shorter, brighter, tighter. Shorter, brighter, tighter. Shorter and brighter and tighter than what mom had. Well, why should there be a different standard for what mom wears and for what the girl wears? Why should there be a different standard? Fathers, why should we allow such a different standard in our home from what mother wears and what daughter wears? If it's holy for mother to wear it, it's holy for daughter to wear it. In fact, it's more holy for daughter to wear it. So principles to consider, and then I'll be done. <clears throat> Let me read one more thing that I forgot before I go into the principles. Let me read you some, some statistics. If maybe you're sitting there thinking now, what is he trying to pull? What kind of nonsense is he talking about? Does he think we're going to do that kind of stuff? Let me give you some statistics. In 1920, the police in Sarasota, Florida, took some women off the street for going bare legged. Right off the street. I mean when the ladies showed up all on the streets in 1920 without some something covering their legs with their bare legs showing, the tires went off and the police came down the road and got out of the cars and loaded them up and hold them away. Imagine such a thing. 1920. Oh, funny does. Old fashioned people. Boy, they don't know. They don't know what we do. A 1900, in the year 1900, a bathing regulation, swimming regulation for Atlantic City, New Jersey. Bathers wore a loose fitting suit of wool flannel, stockings, and canvas shoes. The women's suit 
that they wore for swimming took seven yards of material to make. The skirts and the trunks which were under the skirt, both went all the way down to the ankles, and socks were worn to cover the ankles, and canvas shoes were worn to cover the feet. And that was in 1900, and it was a regulation, and you couldn't get out on the feet to go swimming if you didn't dress like that. All right. Let me read you another one. In 1907, on the same beach, a few of the ladies got a good idea that they would try to go swimming without their stockings on. Everything else was the same. The long swimming suit was the same, but they took their stockings off. Very slowly and slyly, a bunch of the ladies took their stockings off. This is what happened. The police chief of that area made a rule. No socks, no swimming. There was no choice. And the ladies were forced by the police officers to put their stockings back on. If they didn't, they could not swim. By the way, Another one. In 1940, in 1940, it was the first time that men were allowed to discard their shirts. Up until that time, and all up until that time, you were considered nude if you went outside, a man, if he went outside with his shirt off. Now, it's considered normal, but God still considers it nudity. All right. Enough on those statistics. I would like to share some principles for you to consider. You ladies, as you're thinking, as you go to the store to consider to buy a dress, I would like to give you some things for you just to consider. We want to give you the principles. We do not want to tell you what color to wear. We do not tell, want to tell you exactly the style that you should wear. But this is what I would like to share with you. Just the principles, and you let God guide you through the principles. Principle number one. Material. When you go to the store to buy material, here's some things for you to consider. Is it too thin? Can you see through it? Is it silky and clingy? Is it thick enough to cover my body? Is it stiff enough that when it lays over the contours of my body, does it cover my body? Will this material help hide the shape of my body or will it accent the shape of my body? What am I getting at? Simply this. Some materials that you buy they are made in such a way that they cling to the body. Therefore, accenting other materials are made in such a way, the stiffness of the material, the thickness of the material, that when they hang on the body, they cover the body rather than accent the body. You should consider that when you're buying material. Also, is the material that I'm buying modest? By that, I mean the definition that we gave earlier. Moderation. Not an elegant material and not a burlap sack. You can find the types of materials that fall in the middle of that. That's what moderate means. That's what modest means. Not the most elegant material that you can buy. In fact, uh, just the other day, I saw a young lady who had a very modest dress on in the sense that it was long enough and it was loose enough but the material that she had chosen made the dress look just eloquent just very elegant so consider that when you consider the, the material that you buy point number two or principle number two when you're considering the color when you're considering a color of a dress Remember the principle of modesty. The principle of modesty is in the middle. What does that mean? It means we're not going to wear all black dresses. But it also means 
not to wear a hot pink dress. So somehow, you need to discern where the middle of that is. You don't want all the bright dresses, neither do you want all black dresses. God wants us to be in the middle of that. Whether it be a print or whether it be a solid. The other day when we were in a store, a couple, uh, some of us couples were out and we went out to have some, a bite to eat together. And afterwards we went into a fabric store and we looked at some fabrics there. And there was a print there of very small dots. If you looked at it for about two minutes, it'd give you a headache. They just, they just seemed to come out of the material in a, in a way that, that bothered your eyes. Well, that's an extreme. On the other side of that would be the, the big prints, like something that you would use to make a curtain out of or, or maybe a cover to put on a couch. Can we not find something in the middle of that? Not the brightest uh, yellow or pink or, or purple, uh, a light purple with a pink flower or something like that. Can't we find something down the middle of that and therefore fulfill modesty? If you have a whole bunch of bright dresses, you need to buy some darker dresses. If you have a whole bunch of darker dresses, you need to get some dresses that are a little brighter. Moderate is what God is saying. Point number three. Is it loose enough to cover and hide the shape of my body? Is it loose enough to hide and cover the shape of my body? That's what it's supposed to do. The dress you wear is supposed to hide and cover the shape of your body. Does it? Is my cape wide enough that it covers the shape of my body. As you look around the, the, the Mennonite world, you see different, several different types of dresses. Some of the ladies wear dresses with pleats in them. Other of the ladies may wear dresses where it's gathered together with uh, somewhat of an elastic band in it. Now there's a reason for those pleats and there's a reason for the gathering in the dress around the waist. It's supposed to be done that way so that it covers the body. It breaks up the contour of the body. The outer garment should not fit nor look like undergarments. It should fit loose enough that it covers the body. Principle number four. Is it long enough? The dress that I'm making, is it long enough? Now, I'm not standing here uh, pushing that all the dresses go down to the feet. That is not my desire. But it seems very evident from the things that we looked at that God is concerned about your legs and God's concerned that not every man see your legs. Is my dress long enough to cover my legs? That's something you need to consider. Point number five. The hose you wear. Now, I think that uh, the, the type of hose you wear has a lot of variation to it depending on the type of dress you wear. If you wear a very long dress, why, then you may be able to wear a thinner hose. But if you shorten that dress, then you need to thicken the hose because God is concerned about the way your legs look to other men. The leg must be covered. Longer the dress, thinner the hose. Shorter the dress, thicker the hose. Those are some things you need to consider when you go to buying things like that. Here's another. Number six. How about the shoes that we wear? How high is the heel? How dainty are the shoes? Do they have a point on them? All these things work together. Let me give you an example. You can take a very dainty shoe, put a high heel on it, a couple of slits in the side, and put a thin 
black hose on over that and you have a lake that looks the way it shouldn't look to every man around. Think about that. Does my shoe and my hose and the length of the dress that I wear, does it make my legs look the way God would want them to look? Or are they covered? So you see the variables get in here. Longer dress, different type of shoe. Smaller shoe, daintier shoe, thicker hose. You need to consider all those things. Nobody can stand up here and say, you'll do it this way and this way and this way. You consider all those things before the Lord. Another principle. What about your covering? When you think about your covering, ask yourself this question. Is it so thin that you can hardly see it? Can you see your hair more than you can see the covering on your hair? Is your covering a sign or a covering? Does it cover enough of my head to be called a head covering? Or is it just placed on the back of my head? As we study the word covering, and you look back into the Old Testament, and when the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek, why the same Greek word there in 1 Corinthians 11 is the same Greek word that they used in the Old Testament when they talked about the mercy seat being covered over with gold. Does your covering cover your head? These are some things you need to consider. Another principle. We are not out to make everybody in the room look like a river brethren or a horning Mennonite or a fellowship Mennonite or even an Amish. We are not out to set. We are not out set to make everybody look like any of those things. I do not have any problem if you want to look like a river brethren, as long as your river brethren dress fulfills Bible modesty. I don't care if you want to look like an Amish lady, as long as your Amish dress fulfills Bible modesty. Long enough. Etc., etc. Here's a challenge. Let me leave this with you. And then I'll be done. A brother was sharing with me just the other day. He had been in a meeting where I brought a message about child discipline and how you ought to go after the, the will of a young child and, and set out to conquer that, that child's will and do that child a favor. Now he heard a message on that and he believed it. And he went away and he went to his house and he went to work on his little girl and now he is rejoicing they have a new little girl. She's quiet. She sits calmly. She doesn't fuss and scream anymore. And now he's rejoicing. Why is he rejoicing? Because he took God's principles and he bowed his heart to them and he got a blessing from it. May you do the same. I got a phone call at 3.30 in the morning this morning from Katie. A lot of you know Sister Katie. She said, Brother Denny, I just had to call you. My heart was just overflowing. I am so blessed because I obeyed the Lord and was baptized. She could hardly contain herself. Outside, walking up and down in the cornfields and out there in the lane by her house, singing and rejoicing, praying for the Amish people because of the burden she has. How come this lady so excited at 3.30 in the morning that she cannot sleep? I'll tell you why. She heard the Word of God and she obeyed the Word of God and God filled 